He poked me in the ribs with the staff. None of that for you now. I can tell when you try to summon magic, so don't even bother. My summoning wasn't magic, though, but something older, more dangerous. And it worked. I tried to sense it, but there was so much power running through the room I couldn't tell. You should have died that day we entered the castle. It would have been so much better. <laughs> I've always wondered, how did you know? I said nothing. No harm in telling me now. Who warned you? Alec, I grated out. <laughs> yes, of course, but who warned Alec? Keep him busy. Soldier. Named Vlad. His brows pinched. Vlad? But I killed him. You? He overheard some things he shouldn't. I thought I killed him anyway, so he lived long enough to... He shook his head in disgust. All my plans spoiled because I was in a hurry. Well, Lord Strahd, the death I planned for you is fifty years late in coming, but catching you up at last, and it worked. I thought I felt movement beyond the door. It might have been only wishful thinking. Trying for the lordship again, I gasped out, wanting, needing him to talk. Oh, yes, I've never given up on that. You've been a help to me, did you know? You crept around Castle Ravenloft and you stayed out of sight, so it was easy to about you. The peasants say the mists at the border to keep you imprisoned until a hero comes to slay you and set the people free. And are you to be that hero? He smiled. The magic played around his body like glittering smoke. That was what had slowed his aging. How will you do it? I don't think you need to worry about that. You'll be dead, truly dead, after all. So will Lovina and her brood. They're the only other threat to me here. The door was slowly, soundlessly drifting open. I strove hard to look at Leo, and not the small, dark figure coming up behind him. He lifted the pole, but before he could plunge it into my heart, the monk seized Leo's hair with one hand and, with a hard pull to expose the neck, smashed the other into his windpipe. Leo dropped like a stone. The pole clattered over my knees and rolled away. The power holding me diminished. Not by much. I was still held fast by the great symbol on the floor. Desperation prompted me to throw another silent command at the monk. He stooped grabbed my wrists and dragged me clear of the circle. It was enough. I crawled, but it was on my own. I crept over the threshold, past it. Free! Bring him to me, I told the monk, whispering the words into his mind. A pause, then a grunt, and he was pulling Leo's limp body from the room. Leo still breathed, albeit with difficulty, the monk dragged him closer, closer, until I fell on him as a man dying of thirst falls on a pool of water. This was the reason I'd not fed before coming. I wanted him dead, but I'd promised Lavina he would pay, and for this man, I'd planned something very special. Hauling his head back, I bent over his throat and bit hard. I enjoyed the deep drink. Reveled in it, took strength, heart, and hope from it. Toward the end of my drink, Leo fully wakened. I drew back so he could see me. His eyes fastened on my lips, my teeth. I licked at the blood there and took much joy at the change in his expression, turning to utter terror when he realized it was his blood I was drinking. He struggled feebly, a pointless exercise. I held him easily and resumed my meal, this time with his fear adding a piquant flavor to the blood. It lasted until the very end, when his laboring heart finally fluttered to a stop. The look of wide-eyed horror and revulsion frozen on his face would doubtless prove very satisfactory to Lovina. I rose, 
and fixed my eye on the monk, ordering him back into the room again. Not even the promise of finding Leo's spell books could persuade me to enter that hideous trap again. The fellow emerged with an armload of scrolls and tomes. He made a second trip for more. Pocketing a few that looked promising was the work of a moment. Any others? I demanded. The monk shook his head. Take me to the south wall. He started off immediately. I hoisted Leo over one shoulder and followed. We reached the curtain wall. Return to your business, I ordered the monk. Forget everything that's happened from the moment you saw me tonight. He turned on his heel and marched off. I tied Leo's wrists tightly together with his own belt. This done, I looped his joined hands over my head and one arm. Carefully, I eased over the edge of the wall and began to descend. My feet struck a ledge, then level ground. I let him fall, sent forth a call for my horses to come to me. Almost instantly their guards, the wolves, began howling. Soon I could start back to the Wachter estate. Not long after sunset tomorrow, Lovina would see my return. Leo's body had rolled a little way off, ending face up. Something had changed about him. Looking close, I beheld the ravaged features of an old, old man. The magic had left him. A day and a night later, I stood with Lovina and looked at the unmarked square of stone set in the wall of the mausoleum she'd mentioned. When I'd arrived earlier that evening bearing Leo's body, she had been full of indictive approval. But her conclusion was that Leo had not suffered as much as she had expected, and that I had bungled the job. My work is not yet finished, lady. What's left to be done, then, she asked, unable to hide her disappointment. <laughs> you will see. Now, I must ask that he be interred according to my strict instructions. Interred? Oh, I'd rather hang him from the gates and watch him rot. Indeed, lady. But I have my orders from my Lord Strad. With this reminder, she gave in, and things were carried out. The estate mason was called in with others to help, and long before dawn's approach, Leo had been pushed into one of the crypts, a heavy stone shoved into the opening, and the cement troweled thickly into place. Lavina stole a glance my way. Why? she demanded. You will know why tomorrow night. Tomorrow your patience will be amply rewarded, lady. In the meantime, I suggest you meet me here tomorrow after the sun is down. Until then, I cannot tell you more. Is it to do with magic? I spread my hands in a deprecating manner and smiled. She could draw whatever conclusions she chose. They must not have been too pleasant. She left. The next night, we went to Leo's crypt. The cement was as solid as any rock by now, and I checked it carefully for openings. There were none. The mason had done an excellent job. I pressed an ear to the stone. Ah, yes. It was just beginning. Lovina saw the change in my face. What is it? Come, I invited. Listen. She set down the lantern and also put her ear on the stone. Soon, both fear and wonder took her. She straightened and stared at me. What have you done? Fulfilled my Lord Strad's wishes oh, and your own lady. Leo de Lisnia has just awakened to his true punishment. Is he alive? I gave her a hard look. No. <laughs> Nor is he really dead. She made the protective sign of her faith. Its power buffeted against me, but I braced for it and held my place. Tell me what? I raised my hand. Just listen. She resumed that activity, as did I. The little stirrings I'd heard had developed into thuds and cries. Before long, he began to scream. No matter that he had the strength of the undead, he would not be able to shift the stone. No matter that he could change himself into mist, he would not find the least crack to pour through and escape. No matter that he would soon use up his air, he had no need to breathe. No matter. No matter.
he went suddenly quiet, thinking, probably, he would feel the rage as well as the savage joy of his dark rebirth, but most of all, he would feel the overwhelming, gut-tearing, blind madness of hunger. Strahd, he called, his voice distant through the stone. I said nothing. You're there. I know you're out there. I know you hear me. Lovina hissed. That's him. I know his voice. I nodded, thinking I'd have to make her forget this since she'd heard my name. You wanted him to suffer, lady. When you hear him cry, remember your mother's cries. Your sisters. Your... Her hand jerked up to cut me off. All right. Say no more. This is what I've wished for. Free me! Leo shrieked. Lovina flinched, then forced herself to remain still. Please, Lord, I will serve you. Do whatever you wish. Then hear my wish, Leo. Live on for as long as you may, <laughs> and then be damned. Allow. Then more thuds as he beat the walls. His screams were without words again. If he could have beaten his way out, he'd have done so by now. Lovina whispered, will he die? Eventually. The magic will keep him alive in such a place? Yes. Leo became quiet again. It's utterly black in there, I said, knowing he would hear me. He can't see anything except the phantoms of his own mind. He'll beat his head on the stone, hoping to kill himself, but only the hunger will kill him. Her voice was steady and soft. How long will it take? A month. We heard a long, sobbing groan from within. When three months have passed, come here, in the full light of morning, and have your men cocked the crypt open again. Take out what you find there and burn it. Then scatter the ashes. She shut her eyes and drew in a breath of cold air. A chill had entered this house of the dead and the undead. A month? Perhaps a little more. Opening her eyes again, she held them on mine. Then I shall be here for as long as it takes the whole time. I shall listen to him die and pray for peace to come at last to those he murdered that night. I touched her cheek with one light finger. And to those he was unable to murder, lady. Yes, to them as well. She did not back away from me, but did stoop to pick up the lantern. Our skin and clothes were washed in red, echoing the color of its glass panes. I, uh, I have another memory of that night, of Lord Strahd sweeping into the room. He was a tall man with black hair, and his eyes burned like hellfire. He was drenched with blood. It covered him then, as it seems to cover us now. It must have been very frightening for you. I was not frightened. Not then. Or now. Lord Vasily smiled and bowed low. Tenth Moon, 400. Laszlo Ulrich, burgomaster of the village of the Rez of Barovia, understanding that Lord Strahd has a keen interest in magic, wishes to make known to his lordship that he has some volumes recently discovered for sale. Lord Strahd is most welcome to come and view the books, or they can be brought to Castle Ravenloft for his expert inspection. If they were spell books, I wasn't about to trust them to anyone's care but my own, and resolved to travel to Berez myself. I lost no time in setting off. Berez was on the Luna River, and the only thing to distinguish it was its huge manor house. Drawing closer, the flaws of age and neglect all indicated that its present tenant, the Burgomaster, was in sore need of money. If his so-called magical tomes lived up to his expectations, he would have more than enough to restore his home to its former glory. If not, then I would make sure he never wasted my time again. A little after sunset on my second night of travel, I strode up to the once impressive front doors and briskly pounded. The servant who answered was a pale old man. I gave him a card announcing me as Lord Vasily von Holtz, an emissary of Strad von Zarovich. 
he vanished into the depths of the house without a word. Before much time had passed, the master of the house appeared, a look of hope on his face. Laszlo Ulrich was a huge, tough-looking man, but there was a cringing look in his eyes. I am here uh, to look at the books on behalf of Lord Strad, I told him, if you still have them. He did, and was more than willing to show them to me. He took me to a cluttered chamber and opened a decrepit old trunk to reveal a stack of equally decrepit tomes and ancient parchments. I was having a bit of cleaning done when I found this and looked inside, he said. Must belong to one of the old masters of the manor who went in for, you know, thaumaturgic studies, I absently suggested. He was impressed. Y yes, that's it. Well, I took them to Brother Grigor, and he said they were magic books. He thought I should burn them, but I thought they might be valuable to the right person. A wise choice, Burgmaster Ulrich. Uh, then there... Uh, can Lord Strahd use them? He watched as I went through them. All knowledge is of use, I hedged. The books were incredibly precious. I gave Ulrich a generously fair offer for the lot. Then and there he called for his servant to bring Tricker, a local brandy, to seal the bargain. Instead of the old man, it was a young woman who answered his summons. Marina, he said, obviously displeased. I told you to go to bed. I'm sorry, Papa Laszlo, but Willie is so very tired he just put the tray down and get out. The girl did so, stealing a quick glance at me as she hurried away. Only then did I get a glimpse of her. Sway. I staggered back until my legs encountered a chair. Then I sat down rather quickly. Your, your lordship? What's wrong? What's... I waved him off. My mind was quite literally reeling with shock. Ulrich hastened away, calling for the girl. The two of them returned, and the girl pressed a cold rag against my forehead. There, sir, be, just be quiet for a moment, she said soothingly. I looked into her eyes, my heart beating hard. Tatiana, I whispered. There was no reaction from her. Would you like some water, sir? My hand stole up to touch hers. Not a ghost sent to torment me. She was real. <gasps> she was real. Tatiana? My name is Marina, sir. But there was some doubt in her tone. Yet to call him your lordship, girl, put in Ulrich. Same voice, same face, same graceful body. She was Tatiana, come back to life again. I was absolutely witless from astonishment. Ulrich rushed off, muttering about going for help. All I could do was stare at the sweet, beautiful girl before me. Other than her utter lack of recognition of me, she was the same Tatiana I'd known nearly half a century ago. There could not be another. A chill ran down through my limbs. Was this the work of the gods or of dark magics? I don't care. She is here again. And that's all that matters. Your lordship? And I, I am I'm all right, Miss um, Marina. Your name is Marina. Oh, sir, y y your lordship. <laughs> Do you know me? She was trembling. Please tell me. See, I know nothing of my past. Nothing? They found me walking by the river last summer and took me to Brother Grigor. I could not remember anything, even my name, so he gave me a new one. Then Papa Laszlo adopted me. That was very kind of him, I ventured. She flinched. Has he treated you ill? Oh, he, he, he treats me well enough, sir, your lordship. I... Uh, but please, you, you said you knew me? Yes. Yes, I do. Your name is Tatiana. Your home is far from here, in a great castle. You are loved. Loved more than any other woman in all the land. It was quite a lot for her to take in. I will tell you everything you want to know, I promised. But just for this moment, think only on your true name, Tatiana. She did, and repeated it to herself. But I, I don't remember you will. I shall help you. If she'd been somehow reborn into the world... Then a new beginning was before us. A beginning, unmarred by murder and sorcery, free of rivals and all griefs. 
I raised my eyes and smiled at her, receiving a faltering smile in return. It was a start. But before I could pursue it further, Ulrich returned. A second man followed him in. I was summarily introduced to Brother Grigor. His sky-blue robe was a familiar sight, but he was in sandals. This marked him as a member of one of the more fanatic branches of Ilona's faith. Out of respect for Ilona's memory, I rose and bowed to this man. You must sit and rest, Lord Vasily, he pronounced. You are very pale. Uh, thank you, brother, I, but I am much better now. I have had uh, such fits before. They are alarming, but quite harmless. You should come to the church hospice, though, just to be sure, he added. I made it clear I intended to leave. Ulrich made a diffident invitation for me to stay the night, which I graciously declined. He appeared relieved. That made two of us. But uh, what about the books, your lordship? he asked. I gave him a small bag, heavy with gold. This is the first payment. I shall return tomorrow evening with the rest. Before turning to go, I looked past Ulrich and Grigor to Tatiana. Wait for me, I silently told her. Not long after my departure, Brother Grigor went back to whatever hole he dwelt in, and the house grew dark and silent. It took little effort on my part to enter again and look for her. The old servant slept in the pantry, and Tatiana had a small chamber nearby. I chose to softly knock on her door. Coming in under it as a mist would only frighten her. She was afraid anyway, or so she sounded when she asked who was there. It is I, I whispered. Let me in, Tatiana. A bolt instantly slid back. Locked doors are generally not of use within one's own house. Once I was in the room, I asked about it. She looked ashamed. Willie put it there for me. He thought that you might need it. A nod. Against Laszlo? She stared at the floor. Papa Laszlo said that if Brother Grigor approves, he will revoke the adoption and... Marry you? Another nod as she stared at the floor. How generous of him, I said dryly. She gave me a sorrow-filled look. I don't belong here, do I? No. Tell me about myself. I tried to remember the castle you spoke of, but, but I can't. You will. How? Oh, please help me. Tatiana, once upon a time, you were betrothed to a powerful lord of Barovia. He loved you and desired your happiness beyond all other things. Who is this lord? Strad of Castle Ravenloft, I said. Strad? How can it be? He's the lord of Barovia, and I... I am nothing. You are all that is precious to him, more important than life. Then why can I not remember him? Look at me, Tatiana. Look upon me, and you will remember the joy is taken from you. How? Just look. Her eyes were on mine, wide with caution, but willing to take a chance. And then they missed it over. A soft word from me, and they closed. You will remember, I said. You will remember the hall and the music I made for you there and the silk dresses you danced in, and the laughter we shared, you will remember. I, I see things when you speak. Please, tell more. Please tell me. Helda? Strad, I said. Strad? Yes. Remember the lords and ladies swirling about you, dancing in your honor, and the night the shooting stars fell like fiery gems over the valley. I see them, yes. And you were near us. I was with... Strad, I said. You were with me. With you. And I held you close in the garden, and the mist rolled around us like the dancers. And you kissed me. Somehow, my arms were around her. I love you, Tatiana. And you love me. Remember... I love
strong. I murmured into the warm, white velvet of her throat. The following sunset once more found me face to face with Burgermaster Ulrich. It was with much relief that I turned over the last payment, gathered the books, and left. My valuable burdens, carefully placed in my travelling coach, I drove it to the forest. Changing form and taking to the air, I beat my way back to the house hanging in a tree just outside Tatiana's window. After the last candle had been extinguished, she cracked the window open, and I flew across and entered, resuming my man's shape. I prepared her for this. And because of the understanding established between us with my first taste of her blood, she offered no questions, nor did she suffer any fear. Instead, she opened her arms and wept from happiness. No more tears for you, I said, carefully brushing them away. I can't help it. I feel as if I'm waking up after a long sleep. Oh, so much has changed. I pressed her close, content to hold her and think of nothing to simply drift. Will you take me away with you? she asked. Of course I will. When I go, you'll be with me. When? Now? We needed a few more nights of courtship before I could truly sweep her away as my bride. No. It's not possible. Not yet. But please take me soon. There's something wrong. I drew back to look at her. Oh, please, Strahd. I'm, I am grateful to Papa Laszlo, but I cannot marry him. I kissed her brow. You need not worry. He will never touch you, I swear it. Again, I was filled with disgust for Ulrich. I gathered Tatiana into my arms and carried her to bed. There, I spoke of our life together, and when we kissed, she threw her neck back and softly begged me to take her again as I'd done last night. And I did resulting in the greatest of pleasures for us both. The next sunset found me outside a window once more, but this time it was closed fast, and she was unable to respond to my call. I hurriedly changed to mist and seeped through the cracks around the window. Inside, I suddenly understood. The room reeked from prayers and protections. Brother Grigor had been very thorough. A holy symbol had been hung over her bed, and she wore another around her neck. The air was thick with incense and garlic. She opened her eyes and recognized me. Taking off the holy symbol she wore, I rushed forward. They're, they're trying to kill me. She whispered. Tears filled her eyes. I'm here now. You're safe. But I'm so weak. When Brother Grigor came to look after me, it only got worse. In a little while, you will be yourself again. Brother Grigor is uninformed about certain things. So, Grigor had noticed the marks on her neck and correctly interpreted their significance. Another night, and I could lose her. No, never again. Tatiana, you are weak, and before you can come with me, you must grow weaker, but only for a very short time. Then you will be well again. She understood on an instinctive level, uh, by means of the special link between us. You must do what I say, and then you shall be free. When you waken tomorrow, you'll be able to leave. To be with you? To be with me forever after. What must I do? Only gift me with the privilege of kissing you again. I touch the throat with a fingertip. Oh, yes. I kissed her deeply, drinking in a portion of her life so that it could merge with mine. Her only protest was a soft moan when I drew away. I hurriedly tore open my shirt and dug into the flesh above my heart. Our mingled blood slowly welled from the wound. When I pressed her lips to it, she began to drink. I know not what pleasures she may have taken. My own was beyond any that I have ever experienced. I felt her strength return, even as my own poured out to feed it. I murmured to myself, pleading to the dark magics that had made me to grant me this one boon, that she would at last be my bride. Or that sadly there had to be an ending to the ecstasy, lest we both die. With a groan, 
She fell back upon the bed. I dropped to the floor, shaking from fatigue. My recovery was slow in coming. When I was able to stand again, Tatiana was already in her last mortal sleep. There hadn't been any chance to say farewell, but our next greeting would make up for it. Tomorrow I'd come for her, and there would be no more partings. When I awoke, my guardians for the day were restless. I dismissed the wolves and wished them luck. They vanished into the forest and began howling. By the time I had the horses hitched, the night air quivered with many voices, making a savage and sweet wedding song to welcome my bride to her new life. Mounting the lead animal, I guided them toward the Burgomaster's house. Once there, I glided down on silent wings, landing by Tatiana's window. I sensed her strongly on the other side. She was only just now stirring, waking late and languorous. The sudden rush of terror and agony crashed upon me like a physical blow. I fell into the yard, helpless, my chest, my heart, fire, worse than fire. My hands encountered nothing, yet the pain was paralyzingly real. Tatiana was screaming, shrieking, and desperately calling on that silent link between us, calling on me. Then, nothing. The last echoes rose and were lost in the dark. I groaned and cursed and tried to get up. My limbs wouldn't respond. Oh, to die, to no longer have to feel. She was gone. Damnation to the gods. She was gone. As I lay weeping, drained and in shock, Ulrich quietly approached. Grigor said you were the one, he whispered. Her blood, our blood, had splashed all down his clothes. His hands were coated with it. One of them still convulsively clutched a great wooden mallet, its red stains smoking. How could you do such a thing, he asked. My tears ceased. Thoughts of dying abruptly fled from my brain. But no more. <laughs> She's safe from you, safe and free. He knelt by me, and you, may you forever rot. He had another stake and raised it high. I caught his arm as it came down. This bastard had killed her. Rage gave me strength. I wrested the stake from him, rammed the thing into his side, yanked it out, stabbed him again and again. Writhing, he fell away, screaming as I fell on him like a roaring storm out of hell. It was over too quickly, much too quickly for his crime. He hadn't suffered nearly enough. Not as she had suffered, not as I was suffering. I regarded his mangled corpse with bottomless loathing. Dead now. He would suffer no more. And I had eternity before me. An endless march of nights bearing this unbearable loss. Nearly a half century had passed, and I had grown accustomed to the pain. Then, to have a return to have a glimpse of the paradise that lay before us, and then to lose her again. It was too much. Despairing. I gave in to the grief, unable to stop. I walked toward the house, pushed in, and paced down the hall to her room. The old servant sprawled on the floor just outside. He was white with death, his frail heart barely beating. I ignored him and braced myself to go into her. Gone, he muttered. Yes, I stared at the room. At the empty bed. The impression of her body where she'd writhed was there. She was not. What had that pitiless butcher done with her? I dragged the old man up. Where is she? His eyes sagged open, wandering. Oh, poor Marina, poor child. Where? 
He didn't seem to hear or be aware of me. So, so pretty, so sweet. Where? Now he winced and looked at me. The mist took her, he whimpered. Fill the room and gone. Mist. His last words. He exhaled once and moved no more. Twelfth moon, 720. Winter solstice had arrived, a time of endings and beginnings, a time of renewal and death, the longest night of the year. I felt the approach of midnight, an important time, for at the precise moment of the turning of the year, darkness was at its deepest. In relation to the art, this was an extremely important time for magical experimentation, but instead of busying myself, I sat in the study, staring at Tatiana's portrait, as radiant now as it had been over three and a half centuries ago when she posed for it. Much had happened since then, but little had changed. The people still farmed or tended their flocks. They feared me, but were obedient. Those who broke my laws rarely got the chance to repeat the offence, but... Tatiana looked past me, as if none of this were important at all. She may well have been right. I could regard her now with but a twinge of pain. I'd wept away the last of my tears years ago. How many times over the centuries had I met her? How many times had I lost her? <laughs> I could not say. She ever wore the same face, but under a different name. Somehow, I'd always found a way to touch those hidden memories, and somehow, I'd always lost her, over and over again, forever trading joy for grief. Oh, if I could just once break the pattern, break whatever curse that kept us apart. In doing that, I might find freedom for us both. I had tried... Countless times, I poured through every book on magic I could lay my hands on and found nothing to help me understand the nature of my prison. This night, I should have been working, but there was no desire in me to do so. Midnight was upon me and gone. Whatever power I might have drawn from its darkness was waning, not to return for another year. <laughs> but that was a very short time. Year after year fled by. They piled into decades, massed into centuries. How many lay before me? And were they all to be as lonely as those I'd already had? Unable to answer, unwilling to guess, I sat and stared at Tatiana's portrait and felt one more night slipping away into the irretrievable past. dawn was coming, along with another brief stay in my crypt. Lately, my little increments of death hadn't been enough to provide me with sufficient rest. Oh, I was so tired, as if the weight of all my years had come upon my heart as one vast heaviness. I wanted to sleep, oh, sleep for more than just a single day sleep away all my sorrows and lose myself in... <sighs> I wasn't sure. The drift. Dreamless. And serene. To forget. To... rest. Van Richten turned the page and found the next to be completely blank. He flipped through the remaining pages of the folio. Nothing. Strad had put down his last lines and simply walked away. His muscles sluggish. After so much sitting, Van Richten rose, picked up his lantern, and walked to Strad's bedroom. 
There was the window leading to the overlook where Alec Willem had died. There was the closet where Strad had hidden the body. The shadows were very thick here, and his lantern hardly made an impression against the... dark. It was growing dark. Blessed powers, he had to get out. His stiff muscles forgotten, he sped downstairs, reckless of the uneven footing. In the bedroom, the shadow, oh, much blacker than the rest, drifted toward the window, flowed over the sill, and paused next to the overlook. A few minutes later, the little hunter emerged from the keep into the courtyard. Strad von Zarevich watched his progress with smiling interest. He considered loosing one of his many guardians to deal with the intruder, but held off. He'd be coming back soon enough, then Strad would deal with him. When the hunter was beyond the drawbridge and lost from sight in the mist, Strad walked back to his study. His book lay open. He extended a hand and caressed the waiting page. Oh, there was so much more to tell. And so much more yet to come. Slipping into the chair so recently vacated, Strad plucked up a quill pen, unstoppered a bottle of ink, and began to write. This has been a Random House Audiobooks presentation.